Okay, we're now recording, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. And John, would you like to take minutes? Of course, you can always sure. do it do it from the recording. Thank you. Um, and also, if you would just make a note of any tasks that um, need to be done, so we can review so review that at the end. All right. There is one person who's logged in uh, with just a phone number. Does anybody know who that is? That's Debbie Lind. Debbie Lind. Okay. Okay, the agenda was sent out um, by Beth, and as well as the minutes. Does anybody have any uh, additions or corrections to the agenda? I'll see if I can get that uh, screen shared for everyone. Okay, can you see the agenda on your screen? You should be sharing it from mine. Yes, okay. we can see it. Okay, great. Uh, so hearing no changes, uh, we'll move on to the minutes. Does anybody have any uh, additions or corrections to the minutes? I did have one uh, question on the um, discussion about the the new permission change. Um, I didn't know if permission was granted to be able to mark an item lost or just to be able to change the status of an item, or both. Um, my understanding, um, this is Beth, um, was that we were um, changing the mark. Um, permissions like mark item missing, um, mark item lost. Uh, I, actually, I want to qualify that. Maybe um, missing should still be system and branch, but um, certainly mark damage, mark lost. Um, we were going to change to a consortial level permission. Okay. My assumption was that missing is is more of a local um, thing because it's it's usually when you're um, going to find it on the shelf you discover it missing rather than offsite. True. Okay. Hearing uh, no other edits to the agenda or minutes, those will stand as written. Um, we'll move on to the open forum. Would anyone like to comment on a topic not already on the agenda? Uh, this is this is Buzzy from Head River. Um, I was wondering if the council would consider maybe do some research into increasing the number of renewals that we have. Increasing number of renewals. Okay. And Harry, this is this is Brent. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, kind of a question to ask about. Uh, OPAC visibility of the lost and missing status, so for patrons, what they see on catalog searches. Do we want to add both of these to the agenda rather than the open form? Or... Yeah, they could, I think those could be on the sure. agenda. Okay. We can certainly add those under new business.
Okay. Any other comments for or suggestions for the agenda? All right. Hearing none, we'll move on to reports and uh, start with Brent. All right. So, um, and I'll just put this in chat too, but um, this is kind of an overview of the update I gave for the um, UCS LD, UCSLD um, in-service day. Um, and yeah, we basically upgraded the operating systems of all the application and utility servers that run uh, Evergreen so that we can be positioned to have um, so we'll be actually in the loop and we're, we have access to more of the security features and performance advantages of those versions. Um, that included a reinstall of our existing Evergreen uh, installation, which I think went pretty well. There were a few hiccups, um, as Ryan mentioned and a few others probably, uh, the mark uh, templates when you hit Control S we're missing the trademark signs and copyright symbols, but those should be back in right now. Um, I removed some of the older, very, uh, very, very out-of-date uh, security protocols, uh, known as like SSL v3. Um, basically just secured and updated our um, installation to try to future-proof it and make sure that we have backups in the case of something catastrophic happening, which hopefully won't ever. Um, and also just removal and cleanup of our database, which resulted in a reduction of a good portion of the size, which is good not only for performance, but for uh, wear and tear on the hard drives we use. Um, and also in there, I had some uh, kind of training goals for reports and local administration training as well. Uh, the reports training I'd like to do as a two-part affair. Um, it would be better done in person, I think, as kind of a, in a group setting when we're all together, but it could be done um, remotely as well. It's just a little easier to do face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, the first part of the report training would kind of go over um, setting up your login, setting up folders to running basic templates and getting them set to recur and sent to your email, um, finding the type of report you need, things like that. And the second part of the report training would be more advanced and it would cover um, using existing templates as a template to create your own version of a report and how you'd have to create those. Um, and that would have to include a little bit of kind of uh, re relational database uh, training as well on there just to kind of let you know what you're seeing when you're doing the custom building because it might not be included right away. And then secondary to that would just be the local administration training and that's for um, either PICs or library directors to kind of go over things that you would do as an administrator through Evergreen, like setting up um, closed dates, uh, doing setting up a self-check station or doing the receipts, and also things like uh, the offline procedures when we do an upgrade um, or if there is a connectivity problem. Um, and I just wanted to ask the uh, council today if they had thoughts or ideas about a good time frame for that that we could possibly schedule in the next few months or whenever works best. I know it is kind of the holiday time uh, and we're, we are hoping to Evergreen, upgrade Evergreen to 2.9.1, hopefully whenever that gets released. Um, and then moving on from that, just there are a couple proposed um, setting changes that I had, which were to the hold expire interval, which is how long a hold stays on a hold shelf before the hold gets canceled 
and it gets brought back into circulation, which is currently unset at the Sage level, but is set by some libraries. Um, I think, is it Hood River 7? I think it's, I, sorry, I'd have to check, but I think it's around 180 days yeah. um, at Hood River. But, but yeah, what would be a good time frame? Yeah, I know. The, sorry, Ryan, did you say something? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I know in LeGrand we'd like to have that automatic hold expiration, and we actually pull ours after just a week. If you don't pick it up in seven days, you don't get it. And right now we have to do that. That would be great because there are some... There Ryan, was... this is a different setting, though. Um, what you're talking about is the shelf expiration um, time, which is another yeah. setting it might be good to have a sage-wide setting for, uh, which okay. I thought we did. Oh, but... you're talking about, like, unfulfilled holds? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, that would still be nice, too, actually. So. Yeah, so they don't just sit on the shelf or sit a patron has a hold that maybe doesn't get filled forever. Um, so this would at least kill that hold if it wasn't filled after a set amount of time. Um, and then the last part of that would be to disable the patron credit, which a few libraries have implemented now. It's kind of when you're paying a patron's bills, you have the option to forgive, cash, check, I think, and then patron credit's also on there. And this has kind of caused, at least in my experience, a little more trouble than it's worth. Um, it seems that, I mean, I'd like to hear also from the council and the libraries as well, but if they are extensively using the patron credit feature, um, and if so, uh, what that use case is, and um, yeah, why, they're, why they use it, I suppose, over just a forgive option. And I, I wanted to mention that these two um, proposed sage-wide settings are um, down further in the agenda under new business. Um, yeah. Okay. So going back to that, more going to the shelf expire time, um, we have run into a few instances where libraries are keeping our items on their shelves for much, much longer than seven days. Like, in one case, a library was keeping one of our items on the shelf for three months. Was one of our new items. Mm. Is there a way that we can stop that from happening? I mean, we totally get, like, sometimes a patron needs a few more days to pick something up, but it seems like there, there's a limit. Yeah, you're right, Betsy. Um Yeah, we could have a shelf expire interval interval at a stage level as well. Um, well, it's not. I mean, the issue is it might just be you need to talk to individual libraries because I think you can always extend the shelf expire time. You can, and that, so maybe it's an education training issue. Is that what was happening in that case, Buzzy, or were they just not returning the expired hold? Uh, I, believe that they they basically expended extended the shelf expire time to like several months out. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think that's just going to take uh, contacting those particular libraries and explaining what the proper practice should be. Right. Um, and then Sorry, I guess just to finish up the update, I'm sorry I've taken so long here. Um, also, there was an update update to the um, the SIP server that runs um, a couple things from self-checks to uh, library to go to, um, I think, uh, the PC reservation software in some libraries. Um, and so that was upgraded, and there were a few sites that needed to make a few changes in regards to the um, something called the TCP Keep Alive setting. But if you are running into any issues with your SIP uh, applications, please contact um, either Beth and I and we can 
try to get those fixed right away. We've had success with the issues we have encountered. Okay, thank you, Brent. Beth. Okay, um, I summarized um, most of what I've been working on um, in the agenda. Um, basically, site visits, taking advantage of the um, of weather while it lasted, um, and um, doing database cleanup, reports, committee work, um, automation projects are going well. Um, I've got a lot out of the Idaho Library Association conference. First time I've attended that one. Um, and look forward to trying out some of the ideas they had there. Um, particularly a weeding report um, that I found pretty interesting. And um, just recently attended the Oregon Grand Opening, which was also great. Any questions of Brent or I before we move on? No questions. I do, do want to just throw in here, it's uh, a side, um, but I'll include it as the, as the chair. Uh, if anybody's unaware, there was recently a automated uh, materials handling battle between King County Library System and the New York Public Library System. And uh, King County Library System edged out uh, New York, uh, which is a great testament to their use of Evergreen. I know they, they did a lot of work to make Evergreen uh, so robust as to be able to handle that quantity of uh, items in, in a rapid fashion. So it just goes to show what, what's possible with the system. So. Congratulations to them. I think I'll send them a, a card or something on behalf of Sage. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, let's move on to the cataloging Thanks. committee. Um, this is um, this is Beth. Um, and here again, I kind of summarize what's been going on in with the cataloging committee um, and cataloging work um, in the system within the agenda. Um, so I am interim chair. Um, David been, has been hard at work um, working on um, training materials, working um, with individuals who still needed a MARC training class. And uh, we're moving on to work with the, um, what we're now calling the reference guide, which is the former cataloging standards manual. Um, and we reviewed matching standards and came up with some good ideas of how to change those. And we're going to be looking at a draft at the next committee meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Any um, other items anybody would like to add about cataloging issues? Okay, Cir circulation committee is inactive. We'll move on to the courier committee report. Okay, um, the courier committee did meet either earlier this month and we um, talked about um, the reports of damage um, to DVD cases and um, I had before that kind of pulled some statistics on how many DVDs were circulating within a month and um, looking at purchasing DVD boxes and did discover that there is enough money in our um, budget to purchase some and so the Courier committee decided that um, that was a good good way to go to protect our resources, and um, so I'll be 
ordering those DVD boxes and distributing them out to the libraries. Um, we did discuss briefly audiobook um, boxes as well as CD boxes, but we're going to bring that up at the next meeting. One of the difficulties with audiobooks is they're all different sizes um, in cases, and trying to find a box that will work for most of those is going to take a little bit of research on my end. Um, so, And we're also working on revising the courier procedures. Um, it's out of date, um, and Jeff has thankfully volunteered to, to take that on. So we'll be looking at that draft at the next meeting. Okay, anybody have anything to add about career issues? I should mention that uh, Carmen, our ILL person, has been working on a redesign of our uh, labels, our career labels. And since um, the discussion from the last SAGE meeting seemed to show that those were just for identification purposes, uh, primarily, we're going to be putting the SAGE uh, logo, which is an image of our library card currently, um, and the SAGE logo on those prominently, and pretty much have that be the sticker. I think uh, I was wondering if I should uh, send that around for SAGE to see if, if that would be problematic for anybody. I don't know if some are still writing the due dates on there, if we need to leave a space for that. This is Buzzy. I was kind of wondering the same thing, because we're redesigning ours, too. And it's a great idea to add the SAGE logo, but um, I wasn't really sure whether to leave the due date field either. OK. I mean, and use it because it's but there's no reason that we need to use it because right. we can print receipts for they really want them. So several people are writing that they do use that due date space. Yeah, I, not everybody has receipt printers, um, so I think the due date for some libraries is still important. Are you leaving a space for destination library, Perry? No, we weren't. I think that's also useful when you're doing a lot of um, a lot of ILL processing, and, and maybe haven't put things in in the bags yet. Um, there are also many of us who do not use printed transit slips, <clears throat> so we put it on. We put the destination on the label rather than relying on a transit slip. Yeah. That does save paperwork. So, I mean, I guess I feel like the destination and due date are still, I mean, we could reduce the area that they take up on the label, but um, mm -hmm. I think they st still serve some usefulness. OK. We'll work that in. Thank you. All right. Nothing from the development committee. Uh, and. I don't believe the governance committee got a chance to meet. Uh, we did have uh, some emergency action with Leo, so that's been taken up members' time. Thank, thank you, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and get a meet, meeting between Thanksgiving and Christmas. OK. Uh, previous business, um, would anyone like to volunteer to take over the chair or vice chair positions? That's still open. Ryan, are you saying you would like to volunteer? I'm not sure which are you <laughs> volunteering yeah, for. The chair. Right. Needs to do it. You guys can Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm wh whichever somebody isn't filling or doesn't want to fill anymore, I guess. 
So that pretty much means you're president. You realize that, right? I gotta get the experience <laughs> somewhere. Um. This is Aaron. Um, I wouldn't mind being the vice chair, but um, I'm a really bad note taker. If someone wouldn't mind doing that. Um, since we record the meetings, Aaron, um, I'd be glad to do the minutes if okay. that's an obstacle. Yeah, that would be fine with me, if you okay. wouldn't mind, Beth. Sure. So we have a candidate uh, for president or for chair, Ryan McGinnis from from Legrand, and Aaron uh, from Milton Freewater for for vice chair. Uh, do I hear a motion to vote those people in or as our new officers? This is Dia. I will move that we um, accept Ryan as our chair and Aaron as our vice chair. And Anne says she seconds. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you very much yeah. for stepping up. You yeah, guys definitely. Appreciate it. Thank you. I will go ahead and finish chairing this uh, meeting and then we'll uh, transfer uh, responsibilities over at the next meeting if that's all right with you. That's fine. Okay. All right, new business, policy review and member guide, Beth. Okay, this is um, just a, um, more of an informational piece um, that some of our policies are a little old and I think could stand some reviewing um, and possibly updating. Um, one of the policies that was mentioned to me um, was our policy for items that are lost and you know depending on at what point they get lost say they get lost in the courier whose responsibility is it to pay um, for the, the missing item um, you know do we try to um, submit a claim to the courier do we just take responsibility I guess just um, just reviewing any policy that we have within the SAGE system um, and making sure that it's up to date and, and what we want it to, to be I think is, is a good thing to do. Um, and also um, I think a member guide, having all the policies in one place plus an explanation of how things operate within SAGE I think will be a good asset um, to our members and something we can place on the website to refer people to. So um, I was going to start work on that. That sounds good. I've always um, kind of wanted to see a report of uh, of items that were build to other libraries. I don't know how that would be done. Um, yeah. I can try to get at that. Um, some of it doesn't, isn't necessarily acted upon within the system or it may not be apparent that it is. But um, I'll try to gather some statistics on that. Perry, would you want a report about stuff that had been billed at other libraries or just stuff that was lost and paid at other libraries? Hmm. Well, I, both would be helpful. Mostly lost and paid so that we could... Uh, have a proper accounting, make sure that we were getting that money back. And it, I know from our staff standpoint, I mean, we kind of have our own procedures, but it might be nice if we had standardized procedures about 
if you're paying for another library's um, item that's either lost or damaged, like kind of if, if everybody could have the same procedures on that, I think it would be helpful. Um, I am assuming most of us highly, highly, highly encourage the patron to write a check to the other library, but right. Yeah, for some of the libraries that are departments of the city or uh, county, um, it's it's a big pain to have a check reissued and sent. Well, I mean, I mean, well, you know, too. I mean, it's a big pain for us as a district too. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Yep. The opposing point, though, is when we have somebody that's willing to pay, we're willing right. to take it, even if it's yeah. cash. And then we'll... True. Right, of course. Um, it's just the process takes so much longer if they pay with cash. Yeah, and I believe that's written up in our policies, is the recommendation is, if at all, all possible, um, to be able to get a check um, written to the owning library. and. Um, the patrons library staff being, you know, willing to, to mail that um, payment to the owning that, library. I think that piece right there, Beth, is one of the keys that needs to be part of if we do standardize this because I've heard of libraries that, you know, have had their patrons told they have to go back to a library because they won't take a check and send it. I oh. will say that as well. Well, you know, Why? one way around that, um, if we were are able to get the online payment going, is yeah, that we true. could we could just enter it through the OPAC um, and have that collected centrally, and then uh, Sage or, or the Baker Library District could issue that payment to the to the uh, owning wow. library. Doesn't the way that the online system work now, though, is if you're a Baker County patron and you go online and you pay your, your bills, it automatically goes to Baker County's bank account? Yeah, it would go to the Baker PayPal account unless there was one set at the top level. But. Yeah, if we set one for Sage and we were thinking of doing this collectively um, and then dispersing, which might be the solution for um, everybody to be able to accept online payments more quickly. You are Something adding to talk that, about. You're adding that so would, work to that process. So that's a monumental amount of work. That's going to I, I think so too, and that's why we were encouraging um, individual libraries to set up their own PayPal accounts and um, get right. this rolling. But. I would say that the, the top level one would only really be useful in the, in the case of a, a lost, damaged, or item payment. We've, we've been exploring the idea of being able to accept payments via things other than cash or check in Legrand, though, and the city kind of has been fighting us on it because of the complexity of being able to, to do that. We'd have to have a new bank account created and a number of other things that are required by the city's auditors and having the centralized one for us at least would be would be better just because of the the complexity that the auditors are making it for us here in Legrand. And I can I can totally see that it's just like as systemically it just adds a tremendous amount of work on Sage's fiscal agent to have to cut all of these checks. Yeah, and and that is true too. There probably is, I mean, with all of our members, quite a number of payments for lost items every month. So just that would be pretty large. Well, and it seems like the easiest is really to get the patron to write a check. Um, so I guess one thing I was never really clear on is do we mail them through the postal service or do we send them through the courier or does it not matter? Uh, 
Well, I would okay. say given the question of lost items through the courier, I would probably want to just send it by the postal system. Yeah, I think that was my assumption, <laughs> is that we would send any checks via the postal system. Something else we can can consider if we want to move further on the idea of centralized accounts is is um, is maybe do how do I phrase this um, kind of like a reconciliation um, twice a year um, and um, that way we're not cutting as many checks. Uh, that's true. It's just an option. Right. Yep, that would be handy. It, it would be an option, although it's still like you have the potential of issuing 125 checks a year. That's probably like magnitudes of, that's probably like twice or three times the number of checks Sage writes in general, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, for the most part, it's true. I mean, I guess my worry is I know you and you and Brent are already stretched pretty thin, and I would hate to spread you even thinner. Well, at least we need to start I with I that. think um, you know seeing what data we can collect about the the number of lost and build items yeah. and see if that helps inform our, our potential. And at least making it clear people are on the same page with what the current procedures are. Right. That's true. Okay. Yeah, sorry, this is Brent. I'd be happy to work with uh, someone that could maybe just uh, kind of look or fact check with me what they might want out of that report so we could start trying to get it built, just kind of what fields you might want to show so we could try to at least get something working to get that displaying. Yeah, I thought, Brent, you and I could maybe come up with a draft report that we could send out and, and then have people critique. Um, yeah, that would be a good idea, too. Okay. Uh, upcoming budget review and discussion. It is that time of year. Um, it is, and so I wanted to put it on um, this meeting's agenda just as a heads up um, to also ask for volunteers for the budget committee. And um, we tried to present a draft of next year's budget at the January meeting so that we can vote on it in March. And so I'm thinking we need to meet in December. Um, this is one of those committees that really is just mainly active during the budget formation and then doesn't have to do anything the rest of um, the year. But So um, if people want to volunteer today, that's fine. Um, I will also send out an email asking for volunteers for the committee as well. Am I still the chair of that, Beth? Well, you know, truthfully, I looked back through um, <laughs> emails and could not really determine who the chair was. I know Karen was um, and had to step sure. down. I took it over when Shannon left, I thought. Okay. Was Shannon chair of it for a while? She was, and Karen took over for her, so maybe you took over for Karen. I think I took over. I was kind of leaving it open um, since it's such a short-lived committee. <laughs> um, we just needed to work together as a team, I thought, to kind of come up with what we thought was a good stab at the budget for our January meeting. So, Well, I am happy to be on the committee and or chair it. Okay. Thank you, Bessie. Thanks, Buzzy. I think it's important that we have some continuity, especially in that particular committee. Oh, definitely. Otherwise, yeah. you know, people are floundering. 
not having any idea. And I think I have a standing seat on that, so I'll I'll participate. <laughs> As fiscal agent, I'm sorry, Perry. That's kind <laughs> no, of probably given. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe between um, Perry, Buzzy, and I, we can establish maybe a time for a meeting, announce it, and welcome participants. I don't know if anybody saw that Marsha Richmond volunteered on the chat too. Oh. Oh. And Delia great. said she's iffy. She'd like to help, but she's iffy about December dates. Marsha, I'm so surprised you would volunteer to do anything extra at this point. Yeah, thanks, Marsha. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. I would like to sit on the committee and be able to tell people where the bones are buried. <laughs> oh, the history, okay. <laughs> All right, that's great, Marie, thank you. Good idea, thanks, Marie. <laughs> great, thanks everybody. Now let's move to proposed SAGE-wide setting changes that uh, Brent mentioned earlier. Let me go back to that slide. Yeah, so, so how long do you think is a good time at the stage level for a hold to be alive without finding a target? So right now I know, I know Ann mentioned earlier, she said hers wasn't working, but it said at 180 days. That might be a little long for some libraries, but you can override this for your library, but I just want to make sure uh, what the consensus is, how long a hold should live before it gets um, automatically canceled. And I do want to interject at um, this point, um, Brent and I are, are working on some some holds reports that will kind of inform libraries on things that have been waiting for copy too long or um, say no copy. Um, so we're going to be trying to give reports that will help libraries be more proactive for their patrons. Um, but we still need this limit in there. Um, May I ask a question regarding this? Yes. Is this, um, is this interval that we're talking about setting there, is this a, in place of those that don't set it? that a patron doesn't set it themselves? Yes, that is, okay. um, yeah, that is the part, yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, so this is Buzzy. Um, given that many of the libraries age protect their items for up to six months, um, it seems like it should be longer than the six months that it is right now. Because that way, if, if a, another library's patron has a hold on that item and that, that's a lonely learning library, then the hold is, could potentially expire like really shortly after the age protection is up. And I have a question about that because that's one of those um, policies probably needs to be reviewed sooner than later because I believe our policy says three months is what the top is and yet we've been changing and adding. Well, we also have a few libraries that do 18 months, which, exactly. sorry if any of you are those libraries, but that seems completely unreasonable to me if you're part of a library consortium. So I think in some respects this kind of has to go in conjunction with that other. Well, if the, the SAGE system-wide policy is supposed to be three months, why do we even have options for any larger lengths of time available in Evergreen? I think there's some history. Um, with the, the six month, I think it was implemented because at that time we did not have the capability to set um, the age, protect, age protection based upon active date. Okay. Um, rather than create date and some libraries um, their books were in processing a long time. Yeah, and we're so, one of those libraries sometimes ourselves. Yeah, so six months was in, 
instituted for that reason, but now we have um, our age protection based upon active date. And so it could be that we could back down from having that as an option if that's what we decided consortial wide. Yeah. See, that makes sense to me. So if, uh, if we can only limit to 90 days, let's say, for the hold protection, then, then I would want to see something like five month hold expiration because that way you get three months for the hold protection and then two months for the hold to be filled. And I don't think I've ever seen a hold that went longer than two months that actually ended up getting filled before it expired at the longer time anyway. If that all makes sense. Um, so just to clarify, would this be three months would be a maximum um, and then, you, but you could have lower than that? I mean, honestly, if I were king of the world, I would get rid of age protection completely, but I know that several of you do not like that idea. But I want to make sure that those of us who choose not to age protect their items can continue choosing not to age protect them. Oh, certainly. I, I think it's uh, age protection has always been optional, and I would hope it would continue to be that way. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't I, see why. I don't see why you would force it. I have, a, it. I have a report of libraries that have over the three-month um, age protection limit, and I was thinking about just emailing those libraries because I think maybe some of them might just not know, um, you know, unless you went by all your items uh, that you have some that are set that that high up. I think it would be good, Brent, um, to communicate with those libraries and see what their reasons are for having the higher settings. And, and it gives us an opportunity to let them know about the active date as well, if, um, if they haven't heard about it. Yeah. So should we? Um, so I'm wondering, do you think we need to do some investigating before we actually propose something and/or pass something? We can yeah, certainly I, do that. It was just ma mainly just getting the discussion started. We don't have to make a decision today if if not everybody's comfortable with that. Yeah, my concern would be that. Um, a hold gets placed on an item that's in processing for longer than 100 days and then that hold disappears because nobody else has ever added an item or or that that item just hasn't that title hasn't been made available and then the patron has no option yeah, but, but they were saying that the hold expiration would apply, the three month protection would apply once the item went out of processing status, right? Well, yeah, but this is hold expire interval, which I think is a different setting. Uh, true. Brent, do you know what our current setting is for in process? Are those um, items placed on pull list? Uh, is it considered holdable? We talked about it. And I uh, just... In process is considered hold. Yeah. So it would get put on somebody's hold shelf or pull list um, so that they could process it more quickly given the fact that there's a hold. I don't know that that is so wait, I... coming up on our pull lists. Uh, that in process items do not come up on our pull lists. It would okay. be really I think this was a recent change okay. that um, might have been made or not. That's why I was asking Brent. Well, I, I haven't made any changes to the status, but I remember the in process was meant to be holdable so that, um, I know that's the evergreen default, um, so that if a library has maybe a record in 
and they're scanning it. It's just so that holds can build up on the item um, before it can stand in put on the shelf. And if you have those appear on our pull list, I mean, those could be records that we pre-downloaded for items that haven't even hit their street date yet. So, I mean, it would just be confusing, at least for our circulation staff, for things that are in process to appear on that list. I mean, maybe okay. it would be useful to have a report that existed in process things that had that had holds on them, but I, would, I wouldn't merge the two together. Yeah, I'd have to double check on this, but I'm pretty sure when you place the hold, it won't be going onto the list to be captured um, while it's in process. But um, the hold will still build. It just will not be targeted to that library for capture. But I'd have to look at that. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the status, um, the copy status um, setting right now, and in process that status is considered holdable. Um, yeah, holds can be have to placed, but out. that doesn't mean that they show up on the pull list. And like, yeah, Buzzy says that okay. could be problematic. Yeah, which is what, yeah, um, it could be. I'm thinking of um, taking all of our items that are just waiting for processing, that are they're cataloged, they're ready to go, and putting them on a, a separate um, shelf location and making them available status so that they will show up on our pull lists. Okay. And Beth, I just checked with the in process while it's holdable, an item in that status is not set to active. So it's only when that item is checked in that it becomes active and thus right. would be targeted for a hold. Got it. Okay. So it's a combination. All right. Is there another status that this is would would make it active that would basically perform the same s function? As soon as you scan the in process item, it would change to reshelving, which does set the item active. So I think the idea is when you're having those items in process, as soon as you scan it that second time, it means you're ready to put it on the shelf. But um, I'd be willing to hear if there's a better way. I don't know, this might be something we could address with a holds report um, to kind of let libraries know of those things that patrons want, but they're in process. Yeah, so we need to prioritize yeah. in our processing yeah. queue. So we can work on that in the, in the holds report. I have another logistical question that was raised in my mind by a comment earlier. Um, if we set this and it automatically expires, will a patron be notified that their hold has been expired or will it just drop out and they won't know? They'll still be thinking they're waiting on a hold. Yes, uh, Dia, there is there is a trigger for an email alert to set, send to the patron to say, sorry, your hold has you know basically lived too long, it has been expired from this library. Um, they would get an email notice about that as soon as the whole okay. was uh, expired. Good. If, if they don't have an email address, um, we aren't we aren't currently notifying the library though with a notice, are we? No, it would just it would just go to the patron. We could set it up to email the library, but that might be. I don't know if the library would. Uh, Want to keep all those. I expect yeah. that would be ignored. And I, I think reasonably it's the responsibility of the patron if they want to continue to have it on hold once the hold has expired after months and months to, to let us know that they'd like to continue to have it on hold because a lot of the time people will find the book another way or borrow it from a friend or something and if the hold gets canceled they won't care. But if they're notified, then they'll at least have the option of putting it on hold again. But if we get a notice and we automatically put it back on hold, maybe we're putting a hold on a book for a person who went out and got a copy from their friend or from the, the local used bookstore for a dollar. And Yeah, very then true. We're, then we're wasting time sending that book to Legrand from 
Hood River when we don't even need it anymore, which I'm happens wondering. here, which happens I'm here several times a month. So I'm wondering um, if it's possible that maybe the smaller libraries may be the ones that um, would have a preference to do just as you're speaking about Brent um, over the larger libraries. Yeah, and that would be possible to send it to a central, uh, instead of the patron getting the notice, the library could, but um, that would, yeah, that's could possible. I just, I don't the, want to talk, but. Could it be set up so that, um, you know, say library A and B doesn't want that sent, but C and F do? Is it possible to, you know, have a few set up and yes. have everybody? Yeah, are yeah. you are you um, talking about those patrons who don't have an email address? Yes, correct. Okay. Because I I can see where you know um, the larger libraries would find that probably more problematic and or more um, bother in a lot of respects than say a smaller library. You know where a patron comes in on a regular basis or or just you know, there's, and I don't want to say I'm more personal, but just because of the fact that it's a smaller community, that usually is the case. Would it be possible to set up something like we do for the overdue notices? And it would be something that people could optionally retrieve if they wanted to. And would that be easier than setting up the email notices for X library, but not for Y library? Well, I think it's important that the patrons get that notice if they have an email. It's whether they don't have an email. Well, no, I know. I'm talking about for the for the library purposes, not for the patron side stuff. Um, it could be possible for if you're are you talking about the printable overdues? Yeah, Brian. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's that I I'm not again sure without looking at it right now, but that was I think that was kind of uh, been depreciated a bit. Um, so we'd have to look at the code and see exactly what it's doing if we can modify it to okay. look at cancel hold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering. I'm, I'm um, just curious if that would be easier for you guys, or if setting up the email thing would be easier for you guys. I'm thinking a report would be even easier because we can query um, canceled holds and find out whether the patron has an email and if not, um, add it to a report. Okay. And so just query creating a report template based on how. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's rather than digging into code and creating notices, I think if we just have. It could even be a centralized report, or we could do individual for particular libraries. But I think if we handle it through the report module, it'll be a lot easier. And if you make a template, people who want it can get it, and people who don't, don't have to. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. Because, like, Anne is saying that they don't need a, a list of canceled holds. You know, and I don't think we'd really worry about it too much, either. But for the libraries that have a lot of patrons who don't have email, I can see how that would be useful. So. so it sounds like Brent's mentioning that if this report is run, it will not only show items that were, uh, the holds were canceled because they, they timed out, but also ones that were canceled because their shelf expire time was hit, which yeah. seems like it'd be a much larger number than the number of holds that just flat out expire because they never get filled. Yeah, so there I might be a lot of white noise. Yeah, but I think we could narrow it down. Um, uh, you yeah, know, they're, based they're upon the, the reason and um, some other factors, I think we could screen out the white noise. So would this report be done instead of emailing patrons automatically who have email addresses? No. No, this would just be for um, those patrons that did not have an email, and so they, there was no way to get them a notification. And this would be in place of emailing the libraries. 
right? Yes. Yeah. And which library would would actually get that notice? The the library who uh, owned the the item and wasn't being fulfilled, or the the library whose patron it was. My assumption was it's the patron's home library because they're the ones yeah. that are invested in serving um, and meeting their patrons' needs. Okay. Well, I think uh, back to the the expire interval, I think that there's there's really a couple different scenarios. There's there's one where we have several copies. Many libraries have copies of an item, and the holds queue is just large, um, and may, it may not be filled before the expire interval um, passes. Um, so it needs to be long enough to not interfere with that, because then the patron would have to get in the back of the line again. And then the other scenario is when there's just one copy or so, or two copies, and you know they're both lost or missing, and um, maybe there's another bib record that that hold could be placed on that actually has copies on another format or something. Um, yeah, and Perry, this the for the question that kind of aroused this change, um, Dan for the the in-service date. I placed the hold on a bid that only had one item, and that item had uh, gone lost. And it didn't look like that bid was going to get any more items on it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So the, the hold was kind of just churning around. And I have a report kind of from uh, that I've shared with Beth, but I'd like to share a little wider that's called Hopeless Holds. And it's holds that um, are placed on bibs that have zero holdable items. Um, and that could be something that's maybe even sent out on the listserv monthly or something like that, just to check. Um, but yeah, it, just, it, was, it was mainly to kind of that situation where there's only one item on a bid that's gone missing or lost or otherwise unholdable. Um, does the patron, you know, how would the patron know if, it was, if there was no fire interval? So this, this this the system may not have this capability, but in your first scenario, Perry, where you said, you know, the whole list is just so long they don't get it in six months, is there a way for the system to send them an email before their hold, like two weeks before their hold expires, that says, hey, you might want to renew this hold, because otherwise they'll lose their queue position. And maybe it can, but it's worth asking. Um, I think there, I think there is such um, a notice that somebody in the Evergreen system was working on. I seem to remember um, some discussion about that on the listserv. So I, th I think technically it is possible. Yeah, I think there is a pre-expire kind of notice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then they have the option to renew it, re basically restart that interval time? Or is it just for informational purposes? Yeah. Yeah. And they can renew it online themselves. Yeah. Hmm. Or they can, yeah, cancel the whole thing, put it on some, uh, another item. So it's possible for them then to renew it themselves. They wouldn't have to go through a library to do that. Yeah, but they they would have to yes, yeah they can cancel and reset the hold from their um, from their my account. Right, yeah. but if if they're in a queue, they don't want to they don't want to cancel. They cancel, it, cancel it, would they have to go to their library in order to renew the the level the interval? For that, I think. So I think that's kind of part of the heart of what 
was just asked. Um, Brent, they could change their hold expire window, right? Um, and wouldn't their setting counteract any system wide setting? Um, I like to log in real quick and have a look. I don't know that we do have any uh, holds queues that are so large it's taking some people six months to get an item, maybe, but um, my concern would be that we're placing a little too much responsibility on the patron for that and, you know, if they missed that email or something and they had been waiting for that hold to be filled for months and months and then it expired, they'd be pretty irate. Yeah. I agree. Well, should we hold off on making any sage-wide settings on hold expire interval, um, do some more research, um, and then come back to the next meeting with, because um, it looks like we have some report options. Um, the it may not be as much of an issue. Okay. That sounds good. So uh, I'll be in favor of that. table this. Yeah. Um, pending you some... can place the hold. You can set a cancel date if you're a patron um, for the hold. So they can set it also if they'd like. But. So if they don't set that, it's, there is no expire interval, is that correct? Yeah, unless the library set it on their own setting. Right. Well, can we actually get some consensus to, to have it set by default to something, maybe a year, and then we could shorten it if, you know, if uh, with more information, but I think there needs to be yeah. something. I think that'd be good. My last system Well, is I think the longest hold. And it, go ahead. I just, my last system used a year, and it seemed to work all right. Well, what's the longest hold anybody or hold uh, block that anybody's using right now? You mean the, of, um, was it the 180 days for whoever the phone number is? Uh, I mean, the highest age protection is 18 months. Okay. Oh, wow. But it sounds like there might be some I think there's consensus only, to get rid of that. Yeah, there's yeah. only like three or four on certain libraries. Okay. About that. Yeah, might as well go for a, a year then, unless anybody wants something lower than that for now. And is there a problem with it being a year? I can't think of any problems it would generate. This is Dia. I would move that we set the hold expire interval for a year at the current point in time, and then we come back with a bit more information so we can make adjustments as need be. Okay, there's been a motion to set it for a year. Is there a second? And yeah. by a chat. Oh, ended by a chat. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. Any objections to that passing? Okay, hearing none, that motion will stand. Thank you everybody. Let's let's move on to the uh next setting proposal. Disable patent credit. Yeah, I was just curious if there are any libraries in the council meeting right now that have used patron credit to um, have for using for paying fines or overdues, um, or if it's just caused issues with them. Because that's primarily what I see when I get um, tickets or e emails. It's about, or I, I seldom see patron credit being used uh, to help a library. Um, 
So I was just wondering if anyone has been using the pay by patron credit option in the bills tab of a um, record. This is Aaron. We don't use it, but it causes nothing but problems for us to have the patron credit. It's been a frequent problem for us. Yeah, and this this will checking this it's will hide the option to even pay by credit. Is there a way to disable it but still allow us to manually add a credit if we need to pay a patron back for something? Like if they returned a, a item that they paid for within the window where we'll reimburse them? Or does it completely eliminate the possibility for it at all? Because that's the only real use we find for it is just as a like Aaron, we have many, many, many issues with it, but we do see some use in being able to say, oh, this patron returned this, and it was within the six-month window, so we'll reimburse them the cost of the item. Can we just put a note on their account that says, you know, we owe them 20 bucks with the date and our name, and that seems to work easier than the credit part. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, this, this credit option is different than the refund option, correct? Yes. It, and it's not negative balance. This is a pay by. So, like, if a patron has ten dollars in fines, you could pay by patron credit. And there's a host of other things. Like, if you get, if you overpay, you can turn the change into patron credit, which I've never seen cause anything but problems. Yeah. I guess, but is there a way to get rid of the refund one? Because the refund one causes all kinds of issues. Yeah, in, in the 2.9 release of Evergreen, there is support for what they call conditional negative balances, which does alleviate a lot of that problem. We've never really been in, trained or learned yeah. ourselves on how to use the credit or the refund capabilities, so we don't, we just don't use them. And and to adjust balances, you know, we add billings to make their accounts. Uh, zero balance is necessary. So I would be fine for turning off patron credit. If I'm remembering correctly at the district in service a couple weeks ago when this was um, presented, everyone kind of went, yay! Yeah, that was the reaction. <laughs> Is there also a way to get rid of the negative balances currently in the system? There is, as it stands right now, you would have to find, like a patron has negative $10, you'd have to find that bill that, you know, maybe they paid $10 and then they returned the item and that gave them an extra credit. Um, you'd have to find that bill and zero it out, kind of like Perry was saying. But um, that is, there is, better, much better support for that in the 2.9 uh, release of Evergreen. Um, but yeah, it still is kind of a tricky area. And there is a feature in the staff client in the admin menu. Uh, there is a, a, a selection called patrons with negative balances, and that will show you a list of all the patrons at your library that currently have a balance below zero. Yeah, and some patrons, you know, they'll they'll pay for a lost book, um, and they'll find it and return it, and then they opt to keep that negative balance um, to offset future fines rather than opting for a refund check to be issued. And in that case, we just, you know, make a note that they opted for that, and um, we don't go back and keep asking them, "Do you want a check to be sent?" Okay. Yeah, I guess our issue has been because of some weird settings, like we would get like a patron, there was an item in lost status, not lost and paid, but lost, and the patron return would return it and would start crediting them back, even though they hadn't actually paid for it. Maybe it's just us who was having that problem. No, we've had that occasionally in Legrand as well when they get the lost status and it automatically bills and then the item comes back, it messes everything up. I, I don't understand how well, that happens. It, how do they get credited well, if, there's, if there's never yeah, been a payment made? It depends made? on the window. Or a, um, 
there's a library setting that after um, and it after so many months it will not um, deduct that from oh, how do I phrase this I'm getting confused um, basically it's um, a setting that the library can choose as to a window of opportunity for the patron to get that lost charge re, um, refunded on their record. And so if that window has passed, that will also affect um, charges. Right. I mean, I think that my understanding of it was it was sort of so I guess because Evergreen hasn't had the lost and paid status for very long, it seems like what the system was doing was it was just assuming every lost book had been paid for. Um, That's true, yes. Like, I mean, we have a policy that says that if you pay for a book, but you lost a book and you paid for it, if you find it within six months of paying for it, we'll refund back the cost of the book and keep the processing fee, which I'm assuming is what that that setting was trying to get at. It just yeah. Because the lost and paid status still isn't really like a very well hashed out status, it's, the system doesn't behave that way. Hmm. I have. I just haven't seen that happen in our case. I guess where it's lost and assumes a payment, even though none has been made. Well, Brent changed a setting on ours and it stopped doing it blessedly. But we still have a whole bunch of old ones that old Well, back to the uh, proposal um, disabling patron credit. Would anyone like to make a motion? And Anne already did in the chat a couple minutes ago. And she, okay. I'll go ahead and second that. The motion is to turn off credit but to allow libraries the option of applying credit if we see fit. And by credit, I think that means applying a negative balance rather than payment by patron credit. Yeah, the credit's almost like another payment method, kind of like credit card or check. Right. Um, yeah. Kind of like work, make our patrons work it off. Right. Well, yeah. OK. Anne says yes, that is her intention. So there's a motion in and seconded. Uh, any more discussion? Okay. Uh, anybody object to that being approved? Hearing none, that motion passes. Okay, let's get back to the agenda. Uh, research increasing number of renewals. Uh, yeah, so um, we just find that we end up having a lot of patrons who hit the two renewal limit and they would like to renew for really legitimate reasons. Um, and you know, just looking around at other consortia, it seems like our renewal number is pretty low. And I was just wondering if maybe we, maybe there could be some research done into possibly increasing it to something like three or four. I wouldn't mind doing that. I frequently have people who, you know, they're doing like the diet books or cookbooks or something like that, and want to have it for a little longer. And on a related matter, um, there is a function of having renewals apply automatically, is there not? 
Uh, I believe so, actually. There, there, there is a new feature. Um, I have some concerns. Um, there was a big debate about that on the um, Open ILS listserv about whether it's a wise policy or not. It was interesting. It like the it kind of came down along one interesting lines because it seemed like the developers all thought it was a great idea, and a lot of like the directors and stuff were pretty skeptical of it. Hmm. I think that the, the negative side was arguing that it removes a lot of re responsibility for the patrons. So they don't really have to pay attention to where the item is. They know right. it's just going to automatically renew. So it could re lead to increased losses, which would then... Um, you know, I mean, if the if the idea is to keep renewing automatically so the patron avoids incremental fines, then if you lose the item, <laughs> that uh, defeats the purpose. And I'm curious about whether. I think uh, we lost your audio, Ryan. Could you repeat that? Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't hear anything from... Ryan, let me go to the chat here. There's some discussion. Report of a patrons that have negative balances so they could be zeroed out. Okay, that's a side discussion. Yeah, Debbie's concern, um, this is Beth, was one that I had um, with patrons who were, you know, possibly waiting for things to come back. It would delay their being able to check out the material. That would be presumably if they don't have a hold on it. Correct. Yeah, I, I think the automatic renewal would be blocked um, by a hold. So I guess it would just depend is, on. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, this is Erin. Um, I think it would be confusing because I think we have a lot of patrons that don't use email or they don't check their email, and they might just assume everything's going to be renewed automatically, and they might not know that book is actually like a high-demand book or there's a hold on it unless they actually called or went on their account themselves. That would be my concern. I think we have a lot of frustrated people. You bring up a good point, Erin. That's true. So what kind of research needs to be done on increasing number of renewals? A survey of kind of the, the standard or? Well, I mean, just, we could look at other consortia. And then I guess I was thinking, maybe not research, but is the general SAGE membership in favor of doing that? OK. Surveying our own membership. Really change it as a library. But it, I mean, I always like to have unified policies as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, between this and the next meeting, we could certainly survey um, the SAGE libraries and find out uh, their feelings, concerns, if there are any. Gauge the support for increasing it three or four times. How high do we want to go? 
mean, my thought was four, four renewals, but total, not additional. Mm -hmm. I've I've actually worked at a system where they had unlimited renewals. Wow, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yes. it meant that we lost or damaged items, just continue renewing them, so they wouldn't have to pay for them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little too radical. Okay, so uh, Brent or Beth will survey the membership before the next meeting. Yeah, I'll Uh, moving on to OPAC visibility for lost missing items. Yeah, so that this is just um, kind of we we're talking about like the in-process status, um, and there are a bunch of flags with these types of statuses that items have. And so, as it stands right now, if you do a search for maybe I don't know something like Game of Thrones on the as a patron on the catalog. It'll also display the items at libraries that are lost or missing, um, which I, I thought as a patron might not be that helpful because these are neither holdable nor, um, you know, they don't. I don't see how that really helps the patron knowing that that library has a lost or missing copy. Um, and so right now that's visible to both the patron and the staff member, but flipping that OPAC visibility flag for those statuses will mean that patrons would not see lost or missing items in OPAC searches, but staff members or people using the Evergreen staff client would still see those items. Um, they would just be hidden from the patron's view. Is there a way to set it so that, say, if it's only been in lost status for like a month, it would still show up, but if it's been for longer than that? Um, right now, it's not that granular. It's kind of more of uh, show it or don't show it. Just because I, I think yeah. that many of us probably have patrons where, like, the item goes into lost and we send them the bill and they're like, oh, damn, I need to turn that in, and then it gets turned in. Yeah, I'm, I was just trying to think of a way to kind of clean up the results. In general, it would help, though, I think. Yeah, well, I think we discussed this a while back, and uh, it was actually a proposal of mine. There wasn't support for it at the time, but uh, I'm still in favor of it. Um, I think the only problem that we'd have is when we have people, maybe volunteers or something, that are that are uh, reviewing donations, donated copies, and uh, they're they're not using the staff client for that. They'll be using the OPAC. So. Oh. But our items don't have a very short um, automatic lost um, period. Uh, Harry, if they have logged in as a uh, account, Evergreen account that had a staff privilege, yeah, they would still see items. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, so I mean, e even if they even if they didn't see it and they decided to add that donation, that would be fine because the item is not showing up because it's lost. And if it, if the other item comes back, then we have two. It's not, not a big deal. Anybody else have uh, ideas about that? This, yeah, this would be sending it back to the, I'm not sure when it was changed, or maybe for the reason, but the defaults are to leave it um, not visible to patrons. But, but yeah. stage-wide, it is set to be visible. Yeah. It is, and that was probably a setting that we decided on early mm -hmm. in our Evergreen installation. Um, And, and it could be because of just the migration, wanting to have 
more information about the status of items mm -hmm. visible. I don't have an objection to changing it. Um, just wondered if that was another thing that we needed to query the the whole consortium about, or um, whether as a council we feel comfortable just making that decision on behalf of Sage. I would think if we're going to send out a, a survey, that's you know an easy question to to include. Would lost item not be listed at all to patron? I think too. Debbie, the answer to that is is correct. That would not show up to the to the patron if the item was lost. And if we added this on a survey, could you add a like an an open um, variable text, whatever kind of a input for people to actually give their reasons if they really had a strong opinion, so that we had you know, some additional information. Yeah, I think we could do that for both questions, actually, um, just to give them more opportunity to share their voice. I think that would be helpful. I guess one thing with the surveys, too, is are we going to limit it to one response per library? So the big libraries don't have an unfair advantage? I think that would be helpful. We have a better we have a better feeling for, you know, how many libraries participated and or, you know, overall percentage wise when we look at it that way. Right. Regarding for donations, I mean, I don't know how other people's catalogers catalog, but um, we try to use Evergreen to look look for whether we have donations, but. Um, our cataloger generally, I mean, she'll look up the ISBN, but she also looks up the title to see if the titles are in the system. So, I mean, depending on your cataloging workflow process, the fact that you already have it may come up in the cataloging process. True. And it makes more work for the cataloger, which is not great. But. Okay, Brent and I will um, put that question on the survey as well, and um, we can report back at the next council meeting. Okay, very good. That concludes our new business. Um, Agenda items for next meeting, so there will be that. There will be uh, maybe a policy review and member guide, reports from the governance and, uh, and budget committees. So I, I feel like if we're doing a policy review, it would be really, really useful to have the circulation committee be active again. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. That's a big component. So that'll be um, on the task list to, to um, revitalize that committee and have a meeting. Um, don't know whether it'll happen this month, but certainly in December. Are there any volunteers to chair that committee? Um, this is Brent. Um, I, I'd volunteer to chair that committee. Excellent. Okay. Um, review of task assignments. Did John? Did you keep a, a list of that? Tasks. Yes, I did. Oh, great. Um, do you want me to go through them? Sure. Uh, Beth will look at purchasing audio books and CD cases. Uh, Jeff from EOU will work on updating courier documents. Uh, Beth will start work on the Sage policy review and member guide. Uh, Beth, Buzzy, and Perry will look at the December dates for the budget committee. Uh, Brent. Or Beth will survey the membership about increased renewals and lost items being visible on the OPAC. Excellent. 
Okay, well, uh, that concludes our meeting. I want to thank uh, John for his service as vice chair and uh, the incoming officers for, for stepping up for those positions. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll conclude the meeting and uh, see you in January. Thank you, Perry, for yeah. being a chair. You've been awesome. Thank you, Perry. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Perry. Bye, everybody. Bye.